Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the third episode of 90 Minutes to Close the Loop, the web series of the European Close the Glass Loop platform and a special edition today as the platform celebrates its one year anniversary. It was indeed last year on the 30th of June that 13 European founding partners and 11 national platforms established Close the Glass Loop, and they were joined in that by Commissioner Sinkovicius in a video message. In our best practice presentation and our news update sections later on, we have prepared some special surprises for you to highlight the main achievements of the past year. In the meantime, we invite you to join our celebration by posting a birthday message on Twitter using the hashtag WeRaiseOurGlass and tagging us at the glass loop. The best birthday tweets will be featured throughout the episode. As usual, you can also join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag close the glass loop. To the right of the live streaming window, you will find the Slido box. This is where you can get involved as an audience by raising your questions and comments. You can vote for your favorite questions and respond to polls. For this event, we have received over 200 registrations, and you can see here a snapshot of where the participants are coming from. For the third episode in a row, Portugal is our number one country taking its revenge on Belgium, which comes second, and France, the UK, Germany, and Spain are also well represented. We also have a global outreach with participants from 27 countries, of which 10 are non-EU. So welcome also to colleagues joining from around the world in the Ukraine, Brazil, Moldova, and the United States, to name but a few. To bring us all together, what better topic to celebrate than the sustainable recovery of hotels, restaurants, cafes, bars, and pubs? It's been a long winter and spring with extended and in some cases interminable lockdowns, curfews, and other restrictive measures on the hospitality sector. And we have all sorely missed the bustling, thriving, jam-packed venues, the candlelit, cozy, romantic evenings, the casual or dressed up occasions, and more generally, the feeling of hospitality and conviviality. So what is your wish for the sustainable recovery of the Horeca sector? Well, you can write your guest book, guest book comment right now in the poll. My wish is that we should stop being afraid. And in that context, I like to think of glass as the cheerful material, the one you'd choose to say cheers, to impress, to raise a toast, or to create a memorable moment. But it's not just about the experience of hospitality. The glass value chain also has an important role to play in getting hospitality back on its feet by addressing the specific challenges of the Horeca sector on the back end of the celebration. The moment when the party is over and it's time to clean up, to make sure that all the glass bottles that were so full of life the night before are indeed collected and recycled in the morning for the circular economy to give those bottles their life back again. And that is why the strong connection between hotels, restaurants, bars, cafes, and pubs, and the glass value chain is such an essential part of closing the glass loop. So how can the glass value chain support the Horeca sector sustainable re recovery? Let's find out in today's main topic. So if you're ready, let's get down straight to it as the clock is ticking. Setting the scene today, I am delighted to be joined by Marie Audrin, Director General at HOTREC, the European Umbrella Association for Hotels, Restaurants and Cafes. And she will be telling us about the perspectives of the Horeca sector in times of uncertainty, but I am sure with great eagerness to reopen. So, Marie, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Paul, for the, the kind introduction and, and the words you, you used to, to describe hospitality. I, I couldn't do better. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure uh, for me to be here with you this afternoon and, and an honor 
uh, because I know today marks an important milestone uh, in the Close the Glass Loop initiative. Um, it's great to see all the work that has been achieved and, and the prospect. Um, it's important for us also as hospitality that uh, certainly we are part of this uh, um, significant value chain and, and this stakeholder dialogue. Um, so really thank you also for, for focusing and bridging to the uh, hospitality sector over the past few months. So indeed, I've been asked to share a few thoughts and consideration about uh, the uh, impact uh, and, and how we see the, the recovery for the hospitality sector. Um, I don't have all the answers. As you can imagine, uh, it will be a long journey to, to recovery and, and, and hopefully a, a journey where we can all support each other. So indeed, as you were saying, the, the past 16 months have been extraordinarily challenging for most of the establishments, which were either forced to close or to operate under significant restriction across Europe and, and across uh, the world, as this pandemic is, is really global. Um, and it was important because of the health priority and, and to make sure there were measures in place uh, to fight and, and restrain the transmission of the virus. Um, today, the progress of the, the vaccination of, of people is significant and, and provide us hope and we'll see hope for exit strategy and, and plan for really reopening for, for many businesses. So that's really a progress because that's important for us that we have this certainty that we are open, but we can remain open. We know there are still a lot of concern, and we know recently uh, with the, 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 the variant progression, but we know as well, and we've demonstrated, I think, that there are ways to open safely and stay open. Um, the, the open and close uh, situation that we had to face over the past month were extremely detrimental for the business, but also for, for the workers and, and the staff. And that's really something important for, for us. Uh, establishments are ready um, to welcome customer back. Uh, I think you've all experienced that. I hope that they've put in place uh, enhanced health and safety protocols, face masks, social distancing, because that's really important. And we know how much the consumer confidence has taken a hit during this, tri this crisis. So we need to make sure so all these uh, measures that customer feel safe to come back uh, to our establishment. And uh, let's not forget, and I know here today there are many municipalities and representatives of cities it's not just the economy, but it's also the social, the dynamism of cities, of region, of rural areas or large city that has been impacted by the closure of hospitality. So that's really in terms of the social, uh, cultural impact that has been uh, massive. And we really want to move away for, from simply staying close. That's really important. So in, in terms of the in, you know, what's the situation today? As you can imagine, really the imperative is, is really on the economic situation to help the companies to reopen and to stay viable. Uh, they've been on lifeline support for many months and, and that was really important that the government and the EU deployed massive support. But let's be clear, reopening does not equal recovery. So we really need to help uh, the companies in this reopening phase as the cash flow challenge is massive for them. As you can imagine, you have to bring back your staff, you have to organize your supply. So we need the certainty, the clarity on the exit strategy, but continued support as well uh, to make sure that we don't see a huge number of insolvencies. Uh, I read and we had a lot of feedback that in some country they fear between one third or over one third of the companies are at risk of bankruptcies. Let's not forget that hospitality sector is primarily made up of SMEs. Over 90% are really small companies. So that's really important for them to feel secure that they can still get the support. So we've seen, for example, that uh, Europe has deployed recently the Global Adjustment Fund for Tourism in Estonia. We had the support of the state aid 
the next generation Europe is a, is a unique opportunity to support us. But um, that's really important to make sure it lasts as long as, as necessary. And I think, you know, speaking to the value chain, we, we all agree that the closure of hospitality had a knock-on effect on many other business. So we need to make sure this whole ecosystem remains viable and, and of course, recover and, and, and restart. Two other challenges I want to highlight today, because I think that's really important for the, the recovery, is of course the issue of the workforce. Um, hospitality is a major employer in Europe. It's about, prior to the pandemic, 12.5 million jobs. Very diverse job for very expert, very qualified to low skilled job. We employ uh, a, a number of young people, 20% 20 20 of the workforce was under 25, a lot of our women as well. So it's a major job creator in Europe. And of course, the pandemic has created a lot of tension and challenge for us to retain and attract the workforce. So that's also something where we will need to prioritize restoring this activity, restoring and, and making sure, of course, we have the skills but we also are able to um, continue to uh, provide jobs and be able to, to start again with all the staff that, that we need. For example, in France, um, it was uh, mentioned that about hundreds and thousands of jobs are missing, and we've seen a number of establishments who are not able to reopen because staff is, is missing. So that's really, we need to create the condition also to attract and retain the, the, the workforce. Uh, the second aspect, and I know it's uh, almost 1st of July, so it's an important date for tourism in Europe, because obviously uh, that's the entry into force of the digital certificate. But overall, our message together with the travel and tourism has been constantly to promote coordination and clarity from the government on how we can restore the, the Schengen and, and the travel in Europe. That's really key to help us uh, to make up for the lost ground, and we hope this summer will be, and we think will be better than last year, but still, it's very challenging. Um, so that's something important because tourism, and, and of course, hospitality are big in the infrastructure of tourism, is one of the, has been one of the fastest growing uh, sector of the economy over the last few years. It's important for many areas in Europe, Europe is the world largest tourism destination, and tourism is about 10% of Europe GDP. So that's really an important ecosystem. Um, and we know that it will be really a challenge to get everybody back on track. But this coordination and, and really trying also to assess the risk the same way among EU countries is really important um, uh, to, to um, uh, to, to have in, in this pandemic. And I think we've made a lot of progress over the past months uh, on, on this. Um, so maybe uh, coming to um, a bit, you know, forward looking, even if sometimes I feel that we are really still on this, uh, uh, facing this immediate challenge. Um, I want to look ahead, of course, with you, and that's, I think, an important topic at what would be the next normal. And certainly sustainability, uh, be it economic, social, environmental, will be at the core of the, the recovery and, and what would be the next normal for hospitality. Um, it's something that um, we had been discussing in Utrecht uh, prior to the pandemic, of course, and, and we know it's not, it's an imperative economically for the business, but also, of course, from the point of view of the consumer expectations, the social changes that we are seeing, and that we have to be ready and we have to be present for this sustainability um, and transition or transformation. But of course, it will be challenging because as you can imagine, especially having to face such a shock with COVID, business will have to balance their need for liquidity and their ability to survive, to restart, with their willingness to organize and, and, and really uh, move to that uh, transition and, and move to this sustainability ambition and the, the, the ambition that, of course, we fully share. 
So that really will be important. And, and what we would need, of course, is to continue to raise awareness in the business community that it can be a plus, that it's important in your business projection, that we need to secure that there will be public funds made available and support and incentive for especially small companies. It will be a lot about public-private partnership. We know it's not just public funds, but there will be massive need for massive support. And of course, the support of the consumer and all the stakeholder dialogue and, and how we combine those three I think we think will be important uh, as a recipe to to make that sustainability uh, bridge and and the transition. So for hospitality, it touches a lot of issues: food waste and food loss, uh, renovation of building, uh, you know, decarbonization, but also the impact on the mobility. And certainly, your initiative, close the glass loop, fits really for us into this. Um, idea of how we can move forward together. So I think what is really interesting is how you can help us and we can help each other to understand the challenge is of the Eureka sector and, and really make that effort to understand the day-to-day -day issues and, and, and really how we can uh, re find solutions. So it's important for us to join forces with you and all the many players to really move and, and work on concrete solutions. So promote partnership at national level, that's really important between all the glass value chain and our establishments, but also look for solutions that will help the sector. Uh, and that's what we like about Close the Glass Loop, that it's really also this platform which is practical, which is uh, business oriented, which has really this ability to make us exchange uh, and, and better understand each other. Um, so uh, again, um, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a very challenging time, but also we want to look at the future um, and, and with all our partners. Um, I will be delighted to, to cheers uh, with you uh, as, as soon as, as we can. And again, Happy anniversary to, to all of you and, and all the best and, and looking forward to working with Close the Glass Loop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie, and for the birthday wishes as well. And, uh, and I hope that uh, they can they can go back your way for a, a total recovery of the of the sector. You you mentioned that it was important for you to, to work with platforms like like Close the Glass Loop. Maybe also just a word on a call to action possibly i mean i think viewing us today are many operators in the glass value chain would you have a, a call to action to them to support you in maybe the one or the other initiative that you're going to be taking uh, soon or that you've already taken well i mean look i, I think the call to action is that um of, of course let's make sure that uh, we work again as an efficient uh, supply chain that we find and we discuss solution to reopen the, the, the establishment and, and we manage the, the flow of people. I know here there are uh, some of our large suppliers, so really important to, to really have those discussions. They're also representative of cities, so how to make sure uh, in a safe and responsible way uh, people are able to come back to establishments and, and we are managing the, the flow of, of people in city, especially with the uh, summer season. We have a campaign called Together for Hospitality and, and our call to action is also to really make sure that uh, we show how much we uh, need each other, we, we work together and that simply um, closing the establishment, it's not a solution either economically but for the social uh, life of, of, of the cities and, and, and many of the places in Europe. Yeah, so Close the glass loop, but open uh, Horeca, please. Could be could be a way to to, to end that and, and give a key message. Thank you, thank you so much for having uh, been with us, Marie. I think that was very very inspirational and, and important to hear from the Horeca sector on these on these matters. And now we will be going into a panel debate to go deeper into the impacts of the Horeca closures on the glass value chain and what solutions we can bring to the Horeca sector.
So for the panel debate, I am joined by three representatives of this value chain. Joao Letras, who is Director of Waste Management at Sociedad Punto Verde. He's joining us from Lisbon in Portugal. Hi, Joao. We have Alessandro Pasquale, who is CEO and owner at Matoni 1873, who is joining us from Prague in the Czech Republic. Welcome, Alessandro. And we have Luis Medina Montoya Helgren, who is Director General for Environment and Sustainability at the city of Malaga. He is actually joining us from Valladolid in Spain. So welcome to the to the three of you. I think to, to have a quick reaction then on, on, on Marie's initial speech, I mean, she mentioned the importance of Hureka. It's not just a question of the impact on Hureka establishments, but the broader socioeconomic cultural impact on, on many other sectors. Uh, Alessandro, you're, you're operating mostly in, 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 in Central uh, Eastern Europe, also towards the Balkans. How, how have you perceived this impact of, the, of all these closures on, on your business? Uh, thank you. Um, well, like everybody else, uh, in uh, in three weeks you discover that uh, one fourth of your business doesn't exist. So, so that has been quite uh, quite an experience. Uh, but on the other side, um, it forces us to do things we never did uh, successfully, and that uh, uh, so it uh, it. It's an experience. It happened once. I hope it will not happen again. Not only for the many unfortunate persons that are not with us anymore, but in general. But I think I think uh, it's we got something, some some learning out of it. And as regard our partner in the in, in the restaurant, of course, that we're at the center of our focus, and uh, we made a lot of initiative uh, uh, initiative to try to support them try to cooperate with them and uh, in the limit of our capacity, of course. Uh, but uh, but I think that, as I said, if something this pandemic period growth is uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, the spirit to help each other a bit, a certain solidarity and that what we applied for the for the Oreca sector. Yeah, so a, a, a big impact, a quarter of the of the business like that. Uh, it's it's also an impact on more than just on on businesses. And 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 Luis, I imagine in Malaga, a city that's you know very much dependent on 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 tourism. Uh, can you somehow describe what that what that impact was or is? And uh, a quick unmute, a quick unmute, Luis. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, I was saying that uh, I will give you just a few numbers so you have an idea of what we are talking about. Uh, uh, Malaga, as many of you probably know our city, we are the, the sixth larger city in, in Spain. We have 600,000 inhabitants. It's a 3,000 year old history uh, city. Uh, traditionally, not very much involved in the tourism business until 20, 25 years ago. Malaga was the capital of the Costa del Sol, uh, Torremolinos and so on. That was sort of the birthplace of, of the tourism industry as we know today. Um, but uh, 25 years ago, we started to change that. We went through a process of uh, making all the historical city uh, a pedestrian area, uh, building hotels and so on. And now, uh, to give you an idea, the service sector, including tourism, hospitality, and retail, it's 80%, 82% of the wealth of the city. Uh, one number, GDP reduction has been 4,800 million euros in this year, in 2020. Uh, that's the equivalent of, of three years growth. Um, a few more numbers. Total economic impact of the tourism uh, sector in Malaga uh, in 2019, which was our peak year after the 2008 crisis, uh, was 2,955 million euros. In 2020, it went down to 1,213. That's a 59% uh, reduction. Uh, hotel travelers, 69% reduction. Total airport passengers, this affects the whole province, not just the city, but it's also a very graphic number. 
we went from 19.8 million passengers in 2019 to 5.1 million passengers in 2020. That's a 74 percent reduction. Uh, cruise ships, which was starting to be a very important, very interesting uh, sector within the tourism business in, in Malaga. We went from two th 288 uh, cruise arrivals and 476,000 passengers to 19 arrivals, which were mostly in the beginning of the 2020 and a little bit in the summer, uh, which is uh, a 93 percent reduction. As you can imagine, this has affected uh, heavily the whole economy of the of the city, particularly the the Horeca sector, which has uh, lived through a 60% uh, turnover reduction. As you can see, we still have many Oreca establishments uh, with, who have not opened yet. They are starting to open little by little. The municipality of Malaga has put in place all kinds of uh, aids and schemes to, to, to help them get back from this uh, tremendous crisis. It's been over already quite a few months that they, they don't have to pay local taxes for their terraces in the street. Uh, we have reduced their garbage collection taxes. We have reduced their uh, uh, property taxes. So we're doing all we can to help them recover. And we're starting to see signs of uh, recovery. But also, uh, we're witnessing some, some problems related to the, the uh, combination or the uh, conviviality between the, the tourism sector and the Oreca sector and the residents of the city. Uh, residents of the city have been living in a very quiet place for over a year. And now everything is starting to get back to normal, getting back to normal. That means people in the street, you know, Spaniards, we're shouty people and we make noise and we always like it to be in a terrace. And uh, that means that they're starting to, to be again some some problems with the city inhabitants. But, uh, you know, we can cope with that and we're just doing everything we can to 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 recover from this terrible situation, as you can see from these numbers. This has been a total a total catastrophe. Oh, it's uh, astonishing and, and astronomical, the, the, the figures that you're putting forward, and I guess also will hamper necessarily local investments in things that are of interest to us today, for instance, uh, waste management. So it'll be interesting to hear from you on, on that later. Um, uh, Joao, in Portugal, I suppose you recognize also the, the, the size of that impact. Do you see also a, a, a sizable impact on, let's say, maybe packaging waste reduction in the end with much less packaging being placed on the market? Yes, well, very much so on the impact in the economy, uh, as Louise also mentioned. Uh, so the confinement and the impact of the pandemic is, is, uh, has been bad for tourism. That's no, no, no doubt about that. Uh, in terms of packaging consumption or packaging uh, waste home sorting or waste sorting uh, by, the, by the Portuguese consumers. In fact, um, last year during the confinement, we actually had um, an increase in the recycling performance. So people, because they were home, they had nothing else to do. And because they already had good um, home sorting habits, we actually had an increase in the packaging sent to recycling, which was pretty good. But of course, we had a shift in the consumption pattern. So uh, people, in terms of the types of products they would buy, you had an increase in online sales and people would uh, consume more of other materials. So um, the challenge for us uh, was, of course, to try to uh, cope with our municipal partners to ensure the best service level possible so that we could uh, cope with now this different scenario of waste production and waste sorting. Um, in terms of what you were uh, asking in terms of general waste generation. So we had a decrease. We had a decrease in the um, municipal solid waste generation because tourism also has a big impact in, in, uh, in Portugal, uh, in the Portuguese economy, but not necessarily overall on, on packaging. And we actually had a pretty good increase in the um, home sorting of glass bottles. Uh, I can tell you regarding the Oreca sector, uh, that the Eureka represents roughly 37% uh, 
have all glass packaging consumed in Portugal. So the Eureka sector plays a very relevant role um, because it's roughly 75,000, 80,000 uh, shops, establishments in between hotels, restaurants and, and cafes. Um, and all the other glass is scattered throughout um, three, three and a half million households. So uh, it's it's for us, it's very, it's very important to be able to, to also help and devise the best strategy uh, for the waste collection with the Eureka sector because we want uh, to have a healthy uh, and striving uh, um, Oreca uh, in 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 Portugal and and to be able to now to 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 grasp this recovery uh, right now we're also uh, not in a very good uh, situation so um, because numbers have been started rising but uh, we're hoping that all the governments all the measurements all the measures taken by the by the government will be able to tackle this uh, this increase in the number of cases so that we can have a safe an enjoyable summer. Yeah, let's uh, let's hope so. I mean, it's good news on glass recycling, but there's still a, a, a long way to go on on, on reopenings. Yeah. And uh, if we if we take the the Hureka establishment, I mean, in a way, I, I I see it a little bit like a sort of a mega household, right, where you'd be eating and drinking in a similar manner to what you'd eat and drink at home, but just many, many, many times over throughout the day, throughout the night. Um, so how does one approach this challenge? I mean, what are really the key challenges of the of the Hureka sector in collecting and recycling their, their glass? I'm asking the question also to the audience. There's a poll on the key challenges that I would like you to answer. But maybe to go to, to, to Luis first, uh, Malaga City. Uh, how do you approach this, this burden, let's say, that Hureka will place on glass packaging, on the glass containers to, to collect the glass for, for recycling? Well, we have we have worked intensively in the last in the last few years, uh, particularly in this uh, glass collection uh, um, scheme. And I will give you again a, a couple of numbers. You know, I can you can see I, I like I like numbers. In 2015, we had a, a collection of 6.9 kilos per inhabitant in the city of Malaga. We had uh, 1,300 containers, and we had no specific Oreca. Uh, collection. So uh, in the historic center of the city where we have the biggest concentration, concentration of the Horeca sector, we had mostly underground uh, containers, which made it very easy uh, for everybody to, you know, dump anything they could do there, you know, so the level of improper waste was very high. We're talking about three 3,000 liter underground containers. Uh, with just a, a, a hole to put everything you want in there. And uh, that was a, a no good situation. So what, what we did, we started to, to collaborate with the Spanish EPR, which is Eco Vidrio, and we agree with them that they will do the collection. Uh, so the EPR would personally uh, organize the collection of class in the city of Malaga. They would be the ones collecting the containers and being responsible for the whole uh, collection cycle, which is, I think it's a good idea because it was a show of responsibility. I mean, EPR is extended producer responsibility. How, how better can you show your responsibility that you take personally the, the task of collecting the, the glass containers that you have contributed, that you, your members, your associates have, have put in the, in the market? So, the, we also work extensively in, in, in information campaigns. Uh, we work also not only with the, uh, with the owners of these establishments within the Oreca sectors, but also with all the personnel, the cooks, the waiters, uh, the assistants. It's very important because though they are the ones at the end, those who take the garbage out to the container. So it's very important that not only the owners are, are aware of, of these needs and and, and what our responsibilities and, and, and the obligation that we have in this sense, but also all the personnel. We enforce the municipal ordinance, so we made mandatory that uh, all the establishment, establishments within the Eureka sector had to separate and deposit in a separate manner their, their glass waste. And, and we started, which is a very important part of this, of this uh, process, a door-to-door, door-to-door collection of glass waste uh, in all the Eureka sector uh, within the historic center, but also 
in other areas of the city where you have a, a high concentration of of horeca um, establishments. They put up three people Monday through Saturday, 8 to 4 p.m. And we also had special campaigns when we had the, the local fair in summer, also in, during the summer campaign. And all this led to the results that we we have from 2019, which was the last uh, uh, year in record, in full record, because as you can imagine, 2020 has been a different story. And and these are these are the numbers we passed from from what are the 6.9 kilos per per person to 15.5 kilos per person, which is a 128 percent increase. We went from 1,300 to 1,714 containers, and uh, we went to one container for every 335 people. And the most important part in this concern is that we went from zero, a specific uh, collection within the Eureka sector, to 1,159 tons of glass collected in the year 2019 from the Eureka sector. So that's the, the idea and how we have done it, basically. So the, the 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 transfer of responsibility, not just a financial one, but uh, also an operational one. Uh, if I if I then go to to Alessandro, because you're you're representing a company that will be mostly putting refillable uh, glass bottles on the market when it comes to, to to glass. In a way, it's a similar thing, right? You have the responsibility operationally to uh, manage the logistics of the of these refillable glass bottles. Um, do you see any specific barriers to the deployment? of these refillable glass systems in, in the Hareka channel? Uh, yes, in uh, in uh, my region, which is Central and South uh, East Europe, uh, uh, there is a traditional of uh, refillable uh, glass. Um, so basically based on, uh, on, a, on a deposit system, the rest. Uh, I, I think this is the, personally, this is the, the best possible solution for for many good reason of course there's some distance limit because transporting glass it's also not easy uh, complicated empty glass i mean but uh, but it's working well now other part of europe uh, don't have this tradition it means they don't have, don't have the infrastructure for the uh, uh, both uh, on the on the premises you know to have enough stock space stock to keep a full and empty a bottle together uh, or uh, or uh, uh, returning infrastructure and so on um, that that's I cannot evaluate what does it mean to to implement uh, the the infrastructure at the end of the day sometimes we are uh, afraid of the consequence to make uh, to make a systematic change like introducing a DRS and it's not only for glass it's valid also for PT I'm supportive supportive of DRS for every material but uh, uh, at the end, sometimes uh, it's it's more uh, costly. It's more, uh, and then the end, the results are less uh, exciting to insist in the old system than take the decision, the brave decision, and move in uh, into a new system. That's my uh, uh, opinion. Um, unfortunately. From the industry, sometimes I see more the trend to try to transform uh, refillable market in one-way market for for number of reasons, uh, and doesn't make me very happy. But uh, but that's as it is. Uh, so my opinion, yes, if possible, I would uh, support uh, refillable glass and uh, and based on a DRS system uh, uh, for the for the horeca. But the, the DRS system that you mentioned, it's it's already currently in place in the sense that when the Hureka channel will be uh, um, ordering its its bottles, there will already be a DRS on those refillable glass bottles, correct? Yes. Okay, it, it's it's for refillables. It's for the okay. refillable system to function. Yeah, but exactly. I support generally glass to be refillable. Mm -hmm. and, and and do you see any specific trends in this in this sector that makes the maybe the distribution channels or the number of rotations? Uh, uh, maybe there's there are specific new consumer demands on on bottles, like premiumization of bottles. Uh, do you see that has an impact on the on the refillable systems as they are in place today? 
I wouldn't say as much uh, uh, consumer demand and consumer happy with glass in the horeca. Of course, I believe glass in the horeca is the right packaging because if we if we indulge in a, in, in a good moment on a, on a table, we like to have it looking good and glass is looking better. There is no doubt. It's maybe, uh, but also by the sustainability point of view, it makes a lot of uh, lot of sense, especially in that uh, in that position. So it has all the pluses. Uh, I think it's it's more a matter of uh, I think consumers are very are very fine with uh, with the refillable glass. Uh, I have here a bottle. This bottle is 15 years old. Doesn't look new, but doesn't look too old. I don't know how many rotation it did, but I know that it's 15 years old, and uh, and uh, it's not such a bad uh, uh, example. Uh, so so I think it's more about. Uh, um, Industry, uh, horeca sector itself, and uh, and uh, an institution to decide where to push, where to push more, through the refillable or to the to the one-way class. Yeah, f- fifteen years is already a teenager, so that's uh, that's that's not bad. That's a long that's a long life already. Um, could we maybe just show the the, the Slido results um, for for the the key challenges that the audience uh, believes uh, is 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 faced with with Hureka? We have that the top answers are lack of staff awareness and training, lack of internal storage space for empties, and Alessandro was mentioning already. You know, refillables, one way glass. It's not so easy to, to to maintain all of this in a small establishment. Uh, Joao, you have a clear action plan on Hureka in Portugal. Do you recognize some of these challenges? And could you also comment on, on, on the ones that are specific to Portugal and how you intend to address them? Yes, clearly. Thank you. Uh, well, we believe that uh, we need to, to tackle the, the, the performance of the Eureka sector uh, sorting glass, um, bringing the Eureka sector, bringing to the Eureka sector uh, practical and convenient solutions. So this means uh, changing the um, the bottle banks, the containers, instead of having just a simple hole for put, to, to put one bottle at a time, to have uh, mechanisms of assisted lifting, like you have already in Spain at the Eco Vidrio very well well implemented them. Um, we also believe it would be important for the PRO, such as ourselves, to be able to um, become more operational if the municipal partner is not being able to achieve the recycling quotas. So uh, again, an example that works well in Spain that we would like to maybe uh, consider here for for Portugal. Um, Regarding other measures, um, the awareness generation, uh, awareness uh, raising in in the Eureka sector is also very important. uh, And we need to reinforce, especially in the the more historical parts of of the cities, the door-to-door collection. So um, we have, uh, uh, unfortunately, a one-size-fits-all solution, which is the... the, um, the, the bottle bank, uh, so the, the, the green container for, for glass bottles, uh, normally 2.5 cubic meter container. Um, and this was initially designed for home consumption, for, 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 the, for the domestic uh, waste producers. So it's not adapted to the, to the Eureka sector. And Eureka is in fact extremely relevant because we are one of the countries in Europe with the highest per capita consumption of glass, if not the highest. So we have 38 kilos per inhabitant per year, um, which makes it quite challenging then to 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 capture at least 60% of this uh, of this amount in in glass. So uh, we definitely need to make life easier for the Eureka. We count on our municipal partners to do this. Uh, we're working together with um, the glass industry uh, and also with our shareholders to be able to 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 bring uh, cost-effective solutions. Of course, if we need to reach um, higher goals, uh, this also means uh, higher costs. So um, we realize that this will probably uh, mean a, a rise in, in green dot fees. But of course, it's what needs to happen because uh, we need to recover this class. We really don't want this class to go to waste. Uh, uh, Alessandro, do, do you see a, a problem with the coexistence of refillable glass and one-way glass in, in Hureka outlets? Is that a problem for, for your business? Um, does it does it maybe limit the kind of space that you have available? Uh, and my other question will also be in terms of the distribution channels. Uh, those are purely commercial, correct? Or are there municipalities that get involved in 
uh, refillable glass loops? Uh, no, I don't see any big problem in the coexistence of the two packaging, which actually are coexisting, because if I'm selling my water with the refillable uh, uh, glass, uh, wine is sold in normally, in, uh, mostly or all in one way glass. So, the, uh, of course, if we sell the same category of product in the two packaging, that's a bit of a headache for the restaurant owner to not make mistakes and lose the deposit he paid, but this is his problem. Uh, that's why the deposit is there so that he will think about twice what he's doing. Uh, so, so no, I don't see problem. And I think actually that is correct. It cannot be on one, all one direction or the other direction. It depends on the critical mass, which allow you to have uh, a refillable uh, uh, product. Uh, also on the um, on the on the environmental impact. If, if you have a good wine, good wine from South Africa, uh, you cannot have it refillable. This makes no sense to send the bottle back to South Africa. So 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 obviously the two uh, can combine. How to implement it more uh, is uh, is uh, um, if you want to. It's, it's more about uh, industry, beverage industry, uh, or producer of uh, bottles, whatever they are, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and restaurant uh, outlet uh, uh, owner uh, uh, to change the mentality. Uh, institution can help in uh, in supporting that, in uh, in uh, in trying to 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 incentivize that. Uh, but they are not, uh, in, by the infrastructure point of view, they're not needed. This is just done by the normal. Anyway, if you go to an outlet with a full bottle, then after then you have the empty truck. You can take the empty. You know? So it's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, it's not a big deal. Just you have to organize the system. But uh, but it doesn't bring any additional cost, neither add any additional, uh, let's say, pollution to to do that. And, and just on the operational side, do municipalities get involved in, in refillable glass loops or is it purely a, a private sector chain, let's say? No, it's a private sector chain, yes. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, I mean, we, we as, as the responsibles of the, of the city and the environment and the sustainability, what we're increasingly doing, uh, and that is on a European level, we're working on towards uh, the new economic paradigm, which is the, the circular economy. Uh, so we are emphasizing and, and trying to promote uh, the the main ideas within this this new circular economy paradigm. Uh, and the beginning of those is is the fact that you have to design out waste. That means that uh, we have to start uh, talking less about how we manage our waste and start to do things so we have less waste. Okay, so we keep products within the system. So in this sense, of course, uh, mm, refillable uh, glass containers is always a good idea. But uh, from our point of view, from my point of view, what we have to do is uh, make or do what, we, for, what makes sense from uh, an environmental point of view. So it's not only an economic point of view that we have to consider when we make these sort of decisions, but also the, the environmental point of view. We have to see what system, which system has the, the, the smaller footprint uh, and, and then decide in, in that sense. And we also have to realize and, and bear in mind that the, the consumer is starting to, to put an interest in, in, in those kinds of things. Uh, we're looking for a consumer that is going to start changing the way he makes these purchase decisions. And more and more, we are going to try to make them see or, or, or make their decisions from an environmental sustainability circular economy point of view. So they will also make their decisions uh, on the information we have to provide them uh, as to how circular is the container of the product they're they are buying. So of course we're trying to to you know involve all the all the stakeholders within all these uh, distribution systems. Uh, reverse logistics is a very important point of view. And there's also a very particular uh, issue in where we also have uh, to work together, which is the uh, delivery of products. Uh, in, in, in our cities, which are more and more pedestrian environments, it's, it's very complicated. And we, we're also creating low emission zones within the centers of our cities. So the last mile, uh, it's always an issue with, uh, for distribution companies that also collect the, the glass that has been used and 
and uh, it's not always easy to reach a, a common agreement and into what are the, the interests of the distribution and the Eureka sector and, and our concerns as, as the responsible uh, authority for the, for the city as a whole. And, and, and if I may, Luis, very, very briefly, because Joel touched upon the idea that maybe they could go to something similar like in Spain with the EPR scheme taking over the operation side. What does the municipality do then in relation to waste management? Once Ecovidrio for you takes over on the operations, what, what yeah. is your key role, maybe in a, in a couple of words? Okay. Uh, and, and what would be your word then to municipalities to say, maybe this is a model that could be useful? Well, basically, it's a supervision role. Uh, we, we just make sure that they are doing things right, that there are no overfills uh, in any containers, that the containers are at place uh, where the, the consumers need them in the Eureka sector or the, of the, or the general citizens. That is always an issue. Uh, people don't want to have their containers in front of their houses, but not too far away. So that is a, a day-to-day issue and it's very important to keep that uh, day-to-day relationship with the with the company in charge of the collection uh, and it, it works very very well I mean once you reach that level of uh, cooperation uh, the results are very promising so you you still have a role on the on the governance and yeah. the placing of the of the containers uh, Joao when you have this dialogue with municipalities what what are the kind of the issues that they might be raising with you to say no I mean we prefer to to, to keep control of our system and how do you try and address that especially with Hereka in mind Yeah well right now we can't we can't do it at all I mean it's it's not allowed in the law so it's it's actually a legal issue uh, more than negotiation uh, matter um, what we would like to see for our next license since our current license ends this year uh, would be the possibility and just to make things clear we don't want to replace our municipal partners we want to keep working together with them especially uh, I totally agree with what Luis said uh, it's very important to keep having all so municipal cooperation and uh, have the ability to still have the municipal inspections to see if the Eureka is sorting right, if the containers are being, uh, if the service level is appropriate and all. Um, but we want to be able to uh, help the municipal partners and take charge of the collection if we see that the progression of the of the the amount sent to recycling will not allow us to reach the the quotas i would say the the major drawback when we when we address this issue with the municipalities is because they have all the investment already made so they have uh, all the trucks all the personnel the the um, the bring banks and so uh, when somebody suggests, well, should I, would I be able to take over? It, it you always get into uh, other types of discussions. So who's going to cover my loss? Because I have all this infrastructure put in place. Uh, but that, of course, to us um, is not so relevant because it's always possible to uh, work with somebody else's uh, um, infrastructure. So the the point here is um, to actually devise plans together do this road together and 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 achieve the the quotas yeah so that there is a path but i mean you're you're stepping on on someone else's shoes as well yeah, so you have a to bit, be a bit. you have to yeah. be careful about where you're walking yeah um, but we're as we say as we say for fun um we're condemned to get along so we 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 need to be able to 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 work and have uh, long sustainable relationships and that's what we've been doing for 25 years yeah, and, and, and maybe now there is again an opportunity. I mean, we're talking about the recovery of these sectors, but also the broader impact on, on, on tourism, on, on, on local income. So maybe producer responsibility might actually solve exactly. a bit of a problem there. Exactly. Okay, I, I think uh, I would like to also raise the question of the of the future, but not necessarily only in terms of collection and recycling, but also in terms of how this whole crisis in the Hureka sector might be affecting the markets in the future, because obviously markets are very much linked with the way packaging is collected and, and recycled. Uh, Alessandro, you mentioned that there were also some learnings uh, coming from this crisis. It wasn't all bad. Uh, can you reflect on some of the consumption habits or societal changes that you foresee might be much more long-term from this crisis that will affect uh, your business, especially in the Hureka uh, environment? 
But um, this is very difficult to evaluate now because we're just back on track for like less than one month. So, so so far it's the, you know buoyant. Everybody uh, want to 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 enjoy what they didn't enjoy for a long time. So so everything is running like hell. So <laughs> difficult to see to see a, a, a change uh, at the moment. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, the pandemic at the level of uh, a restaurant uh, will change significantly. The way we consume is changing certain things like that with the smart uh, smart working. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, people stay home so they don't go for lunch. Uh, this is clear. So so probably uh, the, the all the um, many places, especially in the center or near the office uh, area where they were working a lot with the lunches, with the package and so on, they will have to change something, but that's, that's more like the occasion rather than the, the, the consumption style hmm, that uh, that uh, will change. Generally, I, I used to say that uh, uh, consumer will not pay more for sustainable uh, product, but we stop consuming what is not sustainable. When? I don't know. But I know that sooner or later will happen. So it's up to us to use this time to uh, that's value for retail, horeca, everything, to assure that uh, what we produce and what we sell as the as not only the best uh, uh, environmental impact, that it is sustainable. It means that it's circular, especially uh, carbon neutral, if possible, and so on. So we have to use carefully our time to reach this goal, and time is moving fast, and we don't know when the consumer will make this decision. It can be in five years, nice. Three years, tough. Six months, maybe. We don't know that, but it will happen. It will be a click. No, but I think the the, the issue of the lunches, I think, is very interesting, um, and I, I suppose that's also where uh, workers will be consuming mostly uh, non-alcoholic uh, drinks like water and soft drinks. So that's a still a major shift. That's possible. Um, so thanks for sharing that one, uh, Luis. Uh, very briefly, on a on a general level, how do you see these societal changes, consumption habits in the Hureka sector for a city like Malaga? Do you think it will radically change the way you organize, for instance, tourism? No, I don't think there will be major changes. I mean, there is going to be a, an increase in uh, uh, sustainable, sustainable concern among peoples, as, as it's been mentioned. People are going to be making their everyday decisions more and more based on, 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 on sustainability. Um, but they're also cultural. There are cultural issues. I was, I was thinking the other day, I mean, if you take uh, uh, on top uh, servings. I mean, in Spain, we always prefer our beer on on tap, but we will never like to have our our tonic uh, for a gin and tonic uh, of coming from a tap. So, and that is a cultural thing. We still are one united continent, but uh, we have um, cultural differences between between us, and 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 those are things that have to always be taken into account. That's why we always believe that. Uh, the idea of uh, thinking globally and acting locally, it's a good idea because you always have to uh, tailor your decisions and your systems and how you do things according to the to the cultural to the culture identity of, of your of your city or your country or your province. OK, thank you. And uh, and Joao, uh, do you anticipate any any lasting changes in the in the Hureka sector that could influence the way people consume? Well, um, right now, I'd say the main concern, and as um, Mary, Mary Odreno already uh, mentioned, is uh, how will the Eureka sector survive the crisis caused by the pandemic? Um, we are going through also through a process of uh, legislation uh, change. So we'll see um, probably um, shifts in um, consumption patterns also due to the introduction of uh, regulation for refillable, most likely. Um, and so um, we don't have such a dogmatic uh, approach maybe as, as Alessandro. We think there's market, there's uh, conditions for the two uh, for the two types of consumption to exist, so refillable and, and one way, um, especially because from an environmental standpoint, the issue of distance and water consumption and washing the bottles is also very relevant. But um, 
I would say glass is pretty much safe in certain uh, areas, especially for the case of wine, for instance. Uh, and we are big wine consumers. Um, and also in the case, uh, largely in the case of beer, there's lots of beer on tap, but also lots of beer in, in, in glass. So um, I, I would, we would have to wait to see until the end of the year how the pandemic affects the Eureka sector and then um, try to uh, articulate that with the new legislation uh, coming soon and also with um, the new license and the, the, the powers that we will or will not have uh, to be able to, to, to better contribute to the achievement of the recycling goals. And the, 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 the three of you have mentioned already different types of options. Now you have the, the one-way glass packaging, you have the refillable glass packaging, you have on tap uh, for, for, for beverages. I won't go into the other materials. Um, but what would you consider to be the sustainable packaging mix for Hureka in the future? And where do you think you know, politics, regulations will, will take the Hureka sector, will force the Hureka sector to go. So I'm not necessarily thinking about consumers here. I'm thinking more about your expectations on regulation. Do you think there will be stronger regulations to give a greater role for refillable glass, for a greater role for a well-organized one-way glass collection system, uh, or possibly more on tap? What would be your expectations? Maybe uh, Alessandro first, then Luis, and then Joao. Quick, quick unmute. Sorry, it's all about also quality. Eh? Uh, so it depends uh, uh, which packaging uh, and which uh, way gives the, the right quality of, uh, of the product. Again, it's restaurant. You go there to have a, a good experience. So uh, I personally believe a refillable should be used for everything which has enough uh, uh, quantities and not too far to be, but the two things are connected because you don't bring big quantities from far away. So uh, enough quantity for for having an efficient uh, setup, a reverse logistic and so on. One way glass for everything which come from, from far away uh, 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 or like wines need, uh, need uh, definitely glass to protect from, from oxygen. Uh, tap what is good on tap beer beer is better on tap than in any other way and bigger is the is the tank uh, where it's coming if it's not a keg is it is a tank it's even better and come from a country of beer so i know these things very well even uh, if i'm non-alcoholic producer so definitely beer on tap without any 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 dubs but other things on taps then you have problem uh, of lower quality and i don't think I, th I think you can reach environmental goal without compromise on the quality, which is very important. You have to keep in mind both things. Okay, thank you. Luis? Yes, I mean, uh, we have been uh, going through that. I mean, I agree very much to what has been said. I think that the mix, uh, at the end of the day, it's uh, what makes sense from an environmental point of view. And uh, refillable, it's ideal, always that uh, you have close uh, providers, uh, close sourcers, which is also part of the circular economy to work to work towards the zero uh, kilometer uh, uh, supplying. Uh, but then, you know, collection and recycling, it's a system that uh, particularly within this, the glass sector has been having good, very good results. And uh, the only thing that might change in the in the near future is that the, the new laws make uh, increase the responsibility of the EPR systems. So they have to be you know, to increase their responsibility and, and make sure that they get uh, recycle most of the glass that they put in the market in the in the collection and recycle system. Okay, thank you. And and, and Joao, what's your packaging mix of the future, do you think? <laughs> well, um, I would say the packaging mix and speaking only of the Eureka sector uh, will be largely uh, dependent dependent also on the size of the Eureka establishments, which is something we did not debate here today. Uh, we've done this comparison and we realized that the average area of, a, of an Eureka uh, establishment, especially if we talk if we talk of small restaurants and cafes, is uh, um, the, the the area is uh, smaller than uh, the average establishment in Spain. So when we talk refillable, 
um, it gets increasingly difficult to have the empty bottles uh, in the back because you have less storage. So um, uh, even even though um, I agree with what was mentioned that uh, you will have a lot of consumption on tap, that makes of course sense, especially for, for beer. Um, and um, what we are trying to avoid uh, together with our, our partners and the whole glass packaging chain producers the glass industry is to have uh, glass on the rs so we've studied the topic and we think it doesn't make sense to have um, glass on 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 the rs for for single use so um maybe we'll see an increase in some increase in refillable but uh, the majority of glass will 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 still have to be in one way being collected the, the more cost efficient manner possible in terms of bring backs bring banks uh, through an epr scheme such as ours that's an important uh, uh, last word around the, the size. I mean, it's not one size fits all, and it's not one fit all for all sizes. So we have to we have to be very careful when it comes to Hureka. As a, as a final word, then, because I think we would all agree that the challenge is huge. To just only understand the Hureka sector is one thing. Attribute the right the right solutions is is still another. I would like the three of you to reflect really thirty seconds. Uh, what do you think the close the glass loop platform? can do to help you in your in your endeavors in your initiatives to, to support the Hureka sector um, can I start maybe with uh, Alessandro first this time I would have preferred to be the last uh, <laughs> <laughs> what you can do what you're doing you're doing well you are promoting ideas discussion which is absolutely important I have to say I even learned something today despite I have the uh, I believe that I'm relative competent, so th that's the best you can do. And it's um, sustainability, it's uh, it's normally not really understood like that, but it's a joint effort. And as long as we don't understand that uh, both producer, distributors, outlet, in the case of the Horeca institution, they're not ready to sit around the table and plan the future based on, uh, uh, on, uh, on open cards, and being ready for inv invest for goods and, and also be ready maybe to, to lose a bit of profitability again for the long term uh, uh, sustainability of the environment, but also of the business together because the two things are connected, then we don't go very far. And that's exactly what you're doing. So keep on doing it. Okay, thank you. We, we, I'm glad you learned something. I think we learned more from you. So thank you very much for having been with us, uh, Alessandro. Joao, can you do it in 30 seconds? Yeah, sure. So I would say, first of all, the, the, the opportunity to exchange information and experiences is very relevant uh, uh, and very rich. Um, and, and throughout this, this, this whole uh, close, the, close the glass loop uh, meetings, we've been able to realize that local constraints are extremely relevant. So uh, consumption mix, uh, uh, dimension of Oreca, like, like I mentioned, uh, responsibilities. Uh, so who pays for what and who is responsible for doing it on the field? Um, and, and also statistics. It's really, really, impo really, really important to work on statistics, to be able to account everything the same way so that we have a comparable scenario throughout Europe and that we don't have a biased picture because one's doing the math one way, the other's doing the math the other way. Thank you, Joao. So dialogue from Alessandro, analysis from, uh, from Joao, and uh, Luis, your 30 second. Well, if I have to put the emphasis on something, it would be two things. One, it's research and development, innovation. Uh, any help uh, uh, that you can give in, in terms of uh, improving things and the systems, both for the Eureka establishment, so they have uh, better systems to to manage their glass waste, uh, that would be great. Also for the municipalities, we always in demand for for systems that are more efficiency in the waste collection and waste management. So anything that we can get there from a European uh, platform, it will be fantastic. And and finally, mm, I would suggest. I mean, we have we have an organization in Europe which is EuroCities, uh, which brings together most of the municipalities, local governments. Uh, in Europe, it's sort of uh, the the local lobby of the European Union. So, so any collaboration, any work together that you might do with Eurocities will be in the benefit of everybody because you will bring uh, your message and and your reality to the to the cities throughout Europe. And we will also be able to to get in touch directly with your change and 
and, and associations so we can improve the way we do things everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. The engagement with cities is absolutely key. We have three associations in the platform, including EuroCities, and we're really, uh, really working hard to, to build that engagement. So engagement would be another another important word that we can maybe work on in the, in the platform. So thanks for giving us plenty of work to do. Uh, and thanks a lot for having shared your insights. I think it was a really, uh, a really deep dive uh, debate. So thanks a lot for having been with us. Thank you. And now we move to our one year anniversary special edition of the best practice presentation. So taking us on a journey through the 11 national platforms of Close the Glass Loop is Vanessa Chenault, who you have seen already. She is Senior Product Policy Manager at FEVE, the European Container Glass Federation. And so please, Vanessa, be our guide. Mike, sorry for that. Um, so thank you, Jean-Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be uh, with you today because exactly one year ago, uh, 13 European partners and 11 national platforms launched together Close the Glass Loop uh, with the ambition to reach uh, the famous uh, EU average of a 90% collection for recycling rate uh, by 2030 and also increase the quality of, of collected bass. Um, so the past year, of course, has been a, a year like uh, no other, and that was uh, very much stressed uh, during the, the discussion. But despite uh, this unique context, our partners have demonstrated a very high level of, uh, of commitment. Uh, Adeline will tell you more about uh, the European uh, platform uh, later on, but we wanted to take the opportunity today of this uh, webinar to uh, take you on a journey uh, through the national platforms of uh, Close the Glass Loop. Uh, as you know, and as was stressed again during the discussion, the national level is uh, essential uh, for the achievement of the, of the Close the Glass Loop objectives. And our national partners are implementing uh, tailored solutions for glass collection, which work in their local uh, context. So to mark the first uh, year anniversary of Close the Glass Loop, uh, we wanted to give visibility to these uh, national platforms and also give them recognition for the great uh, work uh, done to close the glass loop despite uh, a challenging uh, context. So without uh, further ado, let's give them the floor and uh, the opportunity to tell you about their activities and achievements over the past 12 months. The last year was extremely successful for the Austrian glass recycling system. Also, we had to deal with the COVID effect. We are celebrating an all-time high quantity of 270,000 tons collected glass. And these are 30 kilograms per capita. That means we are quite close to the 90% collection rate from uh, closing the glass loop. And even during the lockdown, the collaboration between our collecting partners, the industry and all the communities was working perfectly. In 2020, we recycled almost 95% of all household packaging waste, including the quasi-totality of all glass packaging. We strongly believe that our uniform collection system is the key to these high recycling rates. We have one brim bank for at least every 700 inhabitants, so everyone has easy access to a collection point. But we continue to look further. One example is the intermunicipality of Ijian that will replace all of its spring banks with new ones made from 100% recycled content. By stimulating the use of recycled content, we truly close the circular chain. We've recently held the first ever UK Glass Recycling Summit. We're already collecting 76.5% of all glass packaging for recycling. And this summit was the launch pad to drive in collaboration across the entire UK glass supply chain to achieve 90% by 2030. We were joined by parliamentarians, manufacturers, brand owners, retailers and recyclers, all with a shared commitment to building a truly circular economy for glass. The glass recycling rate in Germany is already persistently at a high level of 83%. By supporting the Close the Glass Loop initiative, 
we intend to contribute to the 90% target as stipulated for 2030. We are on a good way to find partners along the supply chain and will examine jointly how we can make glass recycling more efficient. Proudly, I can say in the name of Ecovidrio, the Spanish glass packaging EPR scheme, that this 2020 challenging year has represented a unique opportunity to demonstrate that the whole recycling change has been solid, committed, and capable to adapt to any situation. Moreover, this year has also shown that the glass recycling consumer habit is well consolidated. In a nutshell, we have proven that we have and we will continue closing the glass loop. In the past 12 months, what uh, we've done is to increase the number of glass containers uh, in France. And we've just passed in 2020 the 200,000 level of uh, glass containers. And uh, what we are currently doing is to increase this number. We are investing 8 million euros to help municipalities to install uh, 10,000 uh, glass containers in addition to uh, those, uh, those containers. And uh, that's what uh, we've been doing in, in 2020. Collaborating with key stakeholders, including government information portals, Repack has activated educational campaigns promoting sustainability and responsibility and encouraging consumers and businesses to reduce, reuse and recycle more glass using traditional and digital communication channels. In 2020, due to the impact of COVID-19, the predicted glass rate rose to nearly 13%. But servicing of bring banks was successfully managed through close collaboration with recovery operators and additional funding provided by Repack. We achieved a recycling rate of 87% for glass in 2020, the vast majority of which was captured in closed loop recycling, returning glass into glass product manufacture. 100% of glass recycled in Ireland is recycled on the island. In 2020, internal consumption increased by almost 2% uh, thanks uh, to families, despite a 30% uh, drop in our sector due to pandemic. Collection of recycling grew by 88%, as well as recycling rate by almost 79%, which is more than what investments in revamping and technology could have generated. Corever contributed to this growth uh, with its continued action and and the communication. In Poland, the recycling rates are growing slowly year by year, so the main aim for the first years for the Close the Glass Loop is to improve the quality of collected material. Uh, so we prepared some national eco-design guide as one of the tools, and uh, we are also forced to work online mostly uh, so we had the time to refine the national action plan. Uh, then we also prepared some communication tools, including, for example, presentation on best practices in glass collection. Well, the last 12 months were very different from the other any 12 months that we had before. The consumption of glass, like in many other countries in Portugal, also decreased. Although we were very fortunate that we did decrease the collection of glass in the country, it was exactly the other way around. We had a small increase in the collection of glass. Well, for us, I would say it's it's the um, actual involvement of the Horeca industry, uh, something we uh, we've been seeing. Uh, we can also see that there is a, a knowledge of the of the project within the businesses and, and, and you know uh, people working in, in the field in Sweden. Uh, we can also so see some things that might affect the quality in the future, and, and that's uh, you know from the uh, from the government, and um, that's going to be interesting to follow to see what, where it will end up. Uh, so I, I think that those are the the, the main things for the last five months or so.
So the COVID pandemic has changed uh, everybody's lives uh, and consumption habits. And uh, I think it's very uh, reassuring uh, to hear from our national platforms that the glass packaging recycling chain has been solid, committed and capable of uh, adaptation, to quote uh, Jose Manuel. Um, so what's next? Uh, in our next video, our national partners will tell you more about their plans for the next uh, 12 months. So over the next 12 to 18 months, we will further focus on digitalization, such as smart containers with sensor-based fill level monitoring or QR codes for reporting full containers and any other issues, and electronic ordering and invoice data transfer between partners with uh, one of our sub-companies, which is called Digito. And besides that, we will foster our projects in environmental education for kids and glass collection in the Horeca sector. Together with our partners, we continue to raise the bar. One area of improvement that we have identified is the cleanliness of the bring bank sites. To ensure they remain pleasant and accessible for all, we set up specific projects with the local authorities. Today, one in three cities already uses the mobile inspector app to closely monitor the state of the sites. Over the next months, we will continue to roll out the app. Alternatively, we test subterranean bring banks. In this way, we really look for solutions that work on the ground. To achieve the target, consumers will only need to collect 2.5 kg more glass per year. We will encourage them to do so by showing the benefits of glass recycling and by giving practical advice how to collect glass correctly. It is especially important to create local awareness for separate collection. We as container glass industry are committed to rise this awareness along the supply chain and bring together stakeholders. So working with the entire glass supply chain, we have identified three key areas to focus on over the year ahead. The first is on education and awareness to help consumers do the right thing. The second is maximising sustainability to increase the recycled content of glass packaging. And thirdly, working on a cullet strategy to increase the quality and quantity of furnace ready cullet. We will be reporting back on progress at our second recycling summit next year. The next 12 months will be very demanding because we have a, a big gap to, to close between our 50% of collection rate and 90% that we have came to have in, uh, in Europe. We have clear what are the weak points. So we have as a weak point the Oreca collection. So we have a lot to do there. We are already a big plan to implement different measures, particularly joining force with the other stakeholders from the value chain. What's coming up in the next months are a lot of uh, things and a lot of innovative projects. And maybe I should you know, give you one of them, which is the program we are running at the moment with uh, JC Deco, which is a worldwide company specialized in urban equipment. And uh, we are uh, running uh, two programs in two different cities in France to address the issue of on-the-go collection. And uh, this is one of the main projects we are putting up for 2021. In Ireland, we are working closely with our partner waste contractors and recovery operators to increase our processing capacity as this has become an area of improvement. We are also continuing our education campaigns for consumers, demonstrating best practice in presenting glass for collection and the consequences of contamination of this highly valuable material. With a network of over 1900 bottle banks around Ireland, we will continue to increase investment and support growth in this area and work with new civic community sites and eco parks in response to changed consumer behaviour. This year action and the communication to support a separate collection have increased, as well as the support to local municipalities, including financial. A national agreement valid until 2024 was signed to implement the packaging and the packaging waste directives and extend the producer responsibility. Similar actions are being planned for the next two years to hit 90% recycling. Our focus will be to 
improve the quality of a collection. Uh, over the next year, we will concentrate on education and promotion. We aim to improve the quality of colored collected. So we prepared some training sessions for the local decision makers, which want to start just after vacation period. We will concentrate uh, to show some very simple best practices that can also make color separation of the collected colored easier. Then we also want to expand this kind of work using best practices from other Close the Glass Loop platforms. We are really excited about it. Well, when it comes to the, the coming year, I would say it's, it's working to make sure we have uh, a way to protect the, the collection system of glass we have in Sweden, which obviously is working very well. And uh, also continue to work with, um, with our customers to make sure they, they, they um, can use lightweight, lightweight glass and all that to, to be a, a player in that game. So it's like, I think those are the, the most important things for us. The Covidrio is more than prepared to face this also challenging 2021, where the European Green Deal, the next generation funds and the circular economy package will be put in place in Spain. In this context, we have to reinforce our strategic plan to guarantee that we will achieve the 90% collection by 2025, contributing to the close the glass loop ambition. So we all know that uh, there is no one-size-fits-all solution that would work uh, for all everywhere. And uh, that's why it was important to work with this network of uh, national partners. Uh, that being said, uh, one of the key goals of Close the Glass Loop is to provide a forum for those national platforms to discuss, help resolve uh, common problems and share uh, best practices. Because the actions that are implemented in one country can uh, inspire other national platforms and be replicated and uh, adapted. So that's what we want to achieve in Close the Glass Loop, foster a dialogue around uh, glass collection and, and recycling uh, across Europe. So you've heard today our 11 national platforms, uh, but our ambition is to reinforce them and grow the Close the Glass Loop presence uh, across Europe. So uh, I have a call for you. Uh, if you are part of the glass packaging value chain in a European country and you want to contribute to Close the Glass Loop, uh, please feel free to uh, get in touch uh, with you and we can uh, discuss how to, to work together. Also, uh, the national platforms that you've met today are available if you would like to uh, follow up on what they have uh, presented. So to conclude, I would like really to thank the 11 national platforms for their great uh, support over the past year. And we very much uh, look forward to another uh, year of uh, cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for having taken us on this journey. And it's great to see all those all those faces uh, active in, in glass collection and, and recycling. So that was that was an exciting journey. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. And now we move to our last part, the news update special edition one year anniversary. And for this special edition of the news update, I am joined by Adeline Farrelly, Secretary General of FEVE, the European Container Glass Federation. Adeline, one year ago, you were in the hot seat doing the, doing the launch event. So how does it feel to be inside Close the Glass Loop one year on? Well, it's, it's great. I'm glad you're on that side. Uh, I can't believe it's already a year that's passed. So maybe first of all to say happy birthday, everybody. Uh, thank you to all our partners, to the recyclers, to the brand owners, to uh, the extended producer responsibility schemes, to the cities, the municipalities. You see them on screen there, 13 founding partners that mobilized together to get behind the common goal of uh, collecting nine out of every 10 bottles and jars put on the market by 2030. And it's, it's important to say this is a voluntary initiative, so we're all working together to, to, to achieve this goal. 
Um, so I think we've seen very nice work being done on national uh, platforms. Uh, just some few points about what's happening in the EU platform. So Horeca, we have started to work with the hospitality sector to see what kind of collection systems can work for them. We have uh, done a lot of activities during the year between our different working groups and these uh, webinars, 90 minutes to close a glass loop, to be able to share information, share ideas between all the platform uh, partners and, and our visitors. I, mean, I think we have a lot of visitors here today. The municipalities, we have uh, completed a study, a major study, to find out what are the drivers uh, behind the decisions made in municipalities about what collection system to put in place, calculation rates, the analysis. Uh, we have worked out and learned how do member states calculate recycling rates. And the fines, we're working with recyclers to see how do we basically get more residual waste back into our factories so that we can put a higher recycled content in each of our bottles. So that there's some of the ideas of what we're doing um, in the EU platform. So any sector willing to join us, you'd be very welcome. Please get in touch, closeaglassloop.eu. Um, and I guess now on behalf of us all, I would like to celebrate our first year anniversary. And I was thinking I would light a candle, but then I was thinking, well, we're you know, we're talking about the Horeca sector, we're in the glass sector. Uh, we have to do this virtually uh, this time, but hopefully next time we can support our hospitality colleagues and celebrate there. So it's virtual. Happy birthday. We uh, we raise our glass together, Adeline. So happy happy birthday to the Close the Glass Loop platform, to all the people who have been uh, participating in all of these meetings and, and events. Thank you to those who have joined today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, this episode, and we look forward to, to seeing you to the next ones. Please also write your birthday message in the in the poll, uh, so that we can uh, have that displayed at the end of this of this event, and we will be in touch very soon. Happy birthday. Happy birthday.